Deb, good morning. How are good, you? Very well, thank you. So, Deb, you're the CEO of the Centre for Excellence for Child and Family Welfare, Welfare. is that right? It is. 100 year old and a bit more organisation. Just tell us a bit about the organisation, first of all. It is an incredibly old organisation. It was established um, over 100 years ago uh, by a group of female philanthropists. Um, many of those trusts and philanthropists are still around today. So what's the centre actually do? Um, in generic terms, it's a peak body. Um, mm -hmm. And most people who work in, well, in any industry now understand membership bodies and peak bodies. Um, so in, gen in general terms, what we do is mm -hmm. we've got a, a big bunch of members from local government through to child, youth and family services, uh, primary health providers and the, and the like. And their, in, their combined interest is in the welfare of vulnerable children, um, young people and families. We're also an RTO, um, so we provide a lot of training, uh, tailored training um, and specific trainers, training to a range of workforces, not just our own, but outside of Victoria. Um, mm -hmm. across the country. So one of the big issues we're dealing with as an organisation and, and your members and beyond is around matters of abuse and raw commissions and other inquiries that are underway. Mm -hmm. and I know you're deeply involved mm -hmm. with that too. Mm -hmm. What do you think will be the outcome, not in specific mm -hmm. terms, what do you think this will actually make different in the future? Mm -hmm. um, in, in many ways, the, the Royal Commissions that are going on and the ones that are about to start, such as the Family Violence Royal Commission, um, are an important milestone in, in the history of any country. Um, it's where we uh, look at the things that we uh, have done poorly uh, and the damage that we've done and how we can both correct that damage but um, not do it again. Um, and so in all of that, the opportunities to make sure that children are safe and that they thrive, particularly disadvantaged children. Uh, but first of all, what we've got to do is make sure that people who are survivors of sexual abuse, that, they, uh, that they're that given the opportunity to heal, um, and mm -hmm. that then we start working on how we can make sure it doesn't happen again. Every day I hear, I do hear the sad stories about where things have gone wrong, but I equally hear um, workers talk about their work, they're talking about the children and the families they work with in such inspirational way, hear about the outcomes and the, and the lives that are changed. And I think that we now you know, need to start talking about what is working rather than what isn't working, mm. as well as dealing with um, our past. Yeah, I mean, the, the staff we have and mm. your other mm. members, mm. they're great mm. people. Mm. Most mm. of them are doing mm. brilliant work mm. every day. And there is great sadness in the work that we do, and it's not to not want to acknowledge that, but, mm. but um, out of that, uh, people like you and I, what, what we want to do is, is change that. Yep. An area of particular interest for us is the crossover between the traditional out of home yeah. care, kids in crisis, mm, mm. and increasingly kids with disability that are being relinquished or fam's just not coping mm. with that and kids mm. now entering into the, mm. the out of home care mm. system. Mm. Can you comment about that and what, what you see maybe the future there? Mm. There's no doubt, I mean, there was some research that Auschild and a couple of agencies did last year um, about the emerging trend of uh, ch children with disabilities either being relinquished or, uh, you know, there are protective concerns so they come into care. Um, and there is real, there's some difficulties within the existing workforce about how do we now make sure that we've got the dual skills, which are children who are traumatised but also have a range of disability. What tends to happen when we don't get it right is uh, for those children, their behaviours escalate. And then we find ourselves looking at really expensive models of care. Had we had we, had we done the right thing early on and had the right skilled staff and the right models, we wouldn't then be in that place. So it, it's, 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 it's a problem for the system, but it's also a problem for the child and their family yeah. if we're not doing the right thing early on. Mm. We're doing this in conversation is about the personal journey of mm. leadership mm. and how you got to be in the role that you're in. Tell us mm. a bit about that journey. I suppose I, it was unavoidable that I would, would be doing this work. My mum was a cottage mother for about 14 years and cared for hundreds of children. So we lived together, my sister and I, and you know the many hundreds of children who came through her care. And every Saturday morning, um, the mums of these kids would come to our house and sit around the table and have lunch and watch the kids play, and we would interact with their mums. It was it was pretty, you know, in many ways. Uh, uh, the most, one of the most exciting times of my life because it really did inform what I do now. And a mum 
uh, mum's quite inspiring. Still see the kids, some of them are my siblings. Um, so it was, it was destiny really to end up where I've ended up. I was also a nurse in my early career um, and uh, I was a very shy young girl. That soon sorted me out in terms of um, being able to talk to people and not being, not being anxious about dealing with people. Um, worked in large institutions and helped close some of those down, um, particularly Kalula, which, um, which was out in Sunbury. Yep. Um, and then did lots of service, big service delivery jobs, so worked at Melbourne City Mission and the Salvation Army. Um, and then decided to give policy and advocacy a go. Mm -hmm. uh, and peak bodies, I've run the Council of Homeless Persons for six and a half years, um, went into the department for four and now I'm here. Um, and, um, and, and for me, you know, the most important thing for me is I like people and I also value authenticity. So uh, I can sort of pick it if people aren't being authentic and I suspect people could pick it in me if I wasn't being authentic. And um, so for me, uh, uh, you know, working with people, learning from people, being authentic mm. um, uh, and also um, not being scared of conflict, not being scared to have a debate not being scared about disagreement um, and not being scared to talk about the, the difficult stuff. It's, um, I love all that um, and uh, in this sort of work I think, those things are, I think those things are the fun bits of the job but they're also probably um, uh, very much um, uh, about the way I am yeah. um, and the way I operate in the world. What uh, makes a really good person working at the front line with mm, kids in, in mm, crisis? Mm. Um, you've got to like kids. It's a good start. You've got to like kids and then you've got to um, uh, love seeing them change and grow and actually uh, um, not see the problems as the problems but it's part of their natural growth. Um, and without doubt the workers that I meet on the ground talk about the kids in kids that are doing the most difficult things but talk about them in such a beautiful way. And you've got to be able to stand back from the difficulties and look at things, you know, it's not about you, it's not anything that you're doing, uh, but what can you do to help that child? Mm. What do you see those big picture issues in mm. the next five to ten years? Certainly I think, and it's, you know, a long-standing discussion that, that I have with lots of colleagues, but the role of the community sector organisations in the delivery of services to our communities. Um, you know, there's lots of talk about there's never enough money. Um, I think it's the perfect time to talk about the role of the community sector organisation. Uh, its capability, its capacity, its, to, its ability to draw money in, not just take government funding, um, how it evolves to meet the changing needs of communities. So I think that um, it, we, we've got to have that discussion. But what are kids telling mm. us mm. that would be important for us mm. to do differently? Mm. Um, kids tell us a lot of, a lot of stuff and um, a lot of our research now, and probably a lot of yours, is asking children directly. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, what should we change as an organisation? Um, and many organisations are setting up their own youth ambassador program, so they've got really timely advice from children and families about the sort of things the agency needs to do to get get, get a better outcome for them. Mm. Um, they say a lot of things. Kids often say um, um, they're not involved in decision making, so decisions are made for them. Um, they also um, often say, I don't have much power and control over um, the multiple placements I might have, for example. So one of the things that we need to do, I think, um, carers complain about this as well, is making sure that children are part of the decision making that is happening about them. Because if we want to keep children safe, then we have to open up everything to make sure that we're hearing what mm. they're saying as quickly as possible mm. so we can uh, respond to that. Deb Sabaris, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been my pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you. It's been good.